Welcome. I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate, a discussion that this nation has been having and is going to have for a long time. Trayvon Martin hits home here. A couple of folks to talk about it. You know him, you love him. He's the former Speaker of the House, Terrence Carroll. Glad it's, to have you. Thanks for having me here, and John. Appreciate it. It's even better to have you out of the House of Representatives, so thank <laughs> you for that. <laughs> and from conservatives of color, if I've got that right, Derek Lubbock. American. American conservatives of color. Correct. All right. Correct. We've, Talk to me we've a little bit about that group first. We've gone outside of Colorado. You know, we were Rocky Mountain. Now we're American, and we're working on bridging that gap that historically has existed between conservative political causes and black and brown America. Yeah, no, no. 95% of all African Americans vote Democratic. You, um, you think that's a changeable thing? Uh, I do. It's not changeable in the next 20 minutes, but it is changeable. In the next 20 years? You're getting warm. Getting warm. All right. Hey, I tell you what, let's, let's, uh, let me ask you a couple questions before we get into the details. What is it about this Trayvon Martin case that has grabbed the attention of the, of the nation so much, and that occasionally these cases come along that spark something much, much bigger. Uh, there's often those kind of curiosity cases, the Jean Benet cases, where, where people, you know, it's just odd and it's weird and people can't help but put themselves in it. This one is different. This one seems to be touching a raw nerve. Why don't we start here? Because you've been very outspoken uh, about your opinions on it. Why, why is this so important? What, what's different about it? Yeah, it's more of an emotional response based on um, perceived or real historical incidents that have continued to happen um, to people of color in this country, where a young African-American man uh, could be walking through a neighborhood that he's allowed to be in, um, have nothing but Skittles in his pocket, be confronted, um, be shot dead, and nothing happens at the end of the day. And it's seen, as, it's seen as a perpetuation of the history of what's traditionally happened to young black men in this country. And especially for those of us who uh, grew up during a, certain, during a certain time period, I think I posted on Facebook one day that it, now everyone understands why black mothers are so protective of their sons. Because at some point, every black man has been told by his mother that when you confront it, by the police department do certain things. Don't go to certain neighborhoods, especially if you grew up in a neighborhood like I did in Washington, D.C. So it brings back a, a great deal of uh, emotional hurt, emotional pain. But what, what is it that you wanted to come out of this case? Uh, you, if, if this was seen as within the bounds of the law or if the burden, you're a lawyer, the burden of proof wasn't met by the legal right. standard, isn't that what comes first, even though, even though and I can't sympathize with what, what you've just described. The burden of proof wasn't met. What did you want? Actually, I think I, I, I agree with you that the burden of proof was not met. Um, I think the jury system worked the way it was supposed to work. The prosecution failed to put on a case that was winnable, and perhaps they even overcharged. I don't think the idea, at least from my perspective, was to have, uh, at the end of the day, uh, was to necessarily have a conviction but at least to spark an honest conversation about where we are with race in this country. Mm -hmm. And that's where I am at this point. I mean, there, you, you can argue about the, the legal guilt, and there's a reason they say not guilty and not innocent. Yeah. Um, you, as, as opposed to the moral question of whether there's blood on George Zimmerman's hand. Those are two different issues. I agree. All right, let's, let's bring it over here. You've also been outspoken mm -hmm. from, from a different point of view. Tell me, why is this so important? And uh, Terrence, Terrence and I are in complete agreement. I agree with everything he just said. The, the question you asked was why and how has this been such a touchstone for national discussion? And the answer to that question is because the President of the United States made it so. Uh, the President of the United States went on TV and said, you know, if I had a son and, and that sort of thing and, and elevated this thing to the, to the level that it is. So that's why we're all paying attention to it. Uh, I agree with, with both of you that the, the issue, the court operated in the manner it's supposed to. Uh, the man was, was innocent until proven guilty and that burden of proof was not met. So the verdict was the correct one. Where I come down on all this uh, is that the overfocus and emphasis on the Zimmerman verdict is misplaced. From the time he was arrested, George Zimmerman was arrested, to the time that he was acquitted was 513 days. In that span of time, 11,106 black Americans were killed by other black Americans. None of us know the names of those people. We all know Trayvon Martin's name, and the reason we know it 
is because the people with access to lights, cameras, and microphones made sure we know it. Let me go over here, Terrence. You, you, you said all black moms have had that conversation with their sons. You know, when, when you're uh, confronted with the police, here's what you should do, here's what you shouldn't do, that fear. And after the verdict, I saw, uh, uh, particularly on Twitter, just this barrage of statements from my, my black son isn't safe anymore, he's not safe anymore. But statistically, it's not, it's not going to be the white guy, or in this case, the white Hispanic. It is other African Americans that are shooting other African Americans statistically. That's the much bigger threat. Why is this getting so much attention and, and not that? Actually, black on black crime has always been a conversation in the black community. Uh, I mean, you look at someone like Roland Martin, who, uh, who's a writer, and he's actually kept a running tally of the number of black on black deaths in Chicago over the last few years because it's been absolutely astronomical. My issue with raising this issue, this idea of black on black crime in the same breath as Trayvon Martin is that it's not statistically an anomaly to have blacks mostly killed by blacks because you also have the same statistics to show that whites are mostly killed by whites and no one's running around saying, oh my gosh, it's an epidemic of white people killing each other. I think the emphasis on black on black crime that some people are raising at this point is really uh, a distraction um, from the greater issue of let's have the conversation about how we relate to each other as black people, white people, Hispanic people, whoever else you want to throw in the mix in this country. And how do we have open and honest dialogue about race in this country? It's hard to have open, honest dialogue. It's hard as a white guy to have dialogue about this because you get called, you get called mm -hmm. a bigot very quickly if you start sharing thoughts. I mean, and mm -hmm. and I, I get tired of that. And I, I look at I look at this, and it turned into a complete racial issue, and how this became a white on black crime. I don't know what the hell a white Hispanic is. I've never heard of the term white Hispanic. My, I don't get out that much, but I've never heard of that. <laughs> That's not so, what I heard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if, if I'm a, am, I a, am I a white Italian? Is that what I am? What is, what is, what is white Hispanic? And, and I, I agree, that conversation is a great conversation to have, but this one is more about frustration. It seems as though the black community wanted a conviction at all costs and with the president's diatribe the other Friday morning when he came out and spent mm -hmm. 18 minutes talking about race relations and trying to federalize this this crime people want more people in the black community wanted a conviction although I wouldn't call mm -hmm. it a diatribe I mean it was far from a diatribe and I think he um, actually tried to reduce um, the, 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 the idea that or at least deflate the idea that somehow the Justice Department's going to get involved. And so I, and I wouldn't... All right, I'll I, say it was a psychotherapy session. How's that? I mean, <laughs> it, it, was an it was an attempt, uh, and I think a very thoughtful attempt, to try to explain to America and start a dialogue with the rest of America about this issue. And I'm sorry that someone would call you a bigot, um, but your show is Devil's Advocate. Well, yeah, I mean, and our, Satan our, I can handle. Call and, me Satan, and, and, but and don't call me a bigot. Muhammad did say that <laughs> who the devil was. No way. But, but the, but the, it's but cold. The, but, it is cold. <laughs> it's but, funny, but it's but, cold. But I, but, I, but I do think that in order for us to have that dialogue, even if I don't agree with you, I need to be able to hear you out and hear what you have to say, and you have to be able to hear me. And I think the frustration that many people have, at least that I've talked to in the African American community, is that the emotions behind Trayvon Martin are immediately dismissed, and they shouldn't be dismissed. In the same way that I shouldn't immediately dismiss um, those folks who are uh, who may disagree with me on the idea of, actually don't disagree with me on the idea of guns, but who may have a different perspective than I do on any number of issues and I don't understand. And right. I hearken back to the O.J. Simpson verdict. Women's groups are absolutely flabbergasted that O.J. Jim Simpson was found that guilty. I could understand why, and I, but I also understood that uh, the prosecution in that case um, failed to meet their burden. Well, it was the same thing. It was the same thing, and, and you read my piece on that, and, and I think that's accurate. The 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 jury was not asked whether or not O.J. or whether or not Zimmerman committed murder. They were asked whether or not there was a reasonable doubt that they did. And certainly there was a reasonable doubt. But this issue of a national dialogue, and we hear this a lot. I had this conversation this morning. What exactly is that? Uh, we're having it now. 
I mean, people say we need to have a national dialogue in this country. Well, that sounds good, but it's very airy. You can't have, the country can't have a dialogue, but we can communicate on Facebook. We can tweet. We can go on the devil's advocate and say, how do we feel about these things? It, it's been beneficial in the sense that that national dialogue that everybody says we need to have, we're yeah, having. Let, let me throw something out. When the president was talking about his experiences as a young black man, you know, I can't relate to that, but he, he said a couple things like, I know what it was like because it happened to me. It happened to me when walking by a car and you hear the car door lock as the black man walks by. And the, the message seemed to be, hey, white America, you need to be more sensitive to what that feels like. And I get, I get that point, but I never heard anything from the other side where he says, hey, black America, you got to ask why that is. Why is it that when a black man walks by, a woman in a car wants to lock the door, what is that trigger? Why does that exist? I never hear that question asked. Is it a bad question? No, it's not a bad question. And uh, in fact, President Obama has been criticized by people like Cornel West and folks like Travis, Tavis Molly for actually being too critical of African Americans for speeches that he's regularly given that don't frequently get reported uh, when he goes to groups like the NAACP and the Urban League and black churches where he talks about personal responsibility. The question about, uh, the bigger question about uh, women clutching in purses, and it has happened to me. Even when I'm in a three-piece suit walking from my law firm in the Tabor Center, I've seen women clutch their purse. Listen, uh, anybody should clutch their purse walking <laughs> next to a lawyer. That's not, <laughs> that's not a bad thought. Only if they've signed a retainer yeah, with me yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but <laughs> but, but it, it happens, and, and, and I don't think it's fair. In fact, I know it's not fair to put the onus back on the person who is the subject of derision um, in terms of the, if you walk, I walk by you and you're a white woman and you clutch your purse, it says more about you than it does about me. Does it? Let me ask. I mean, take, take for instance, just we have 380, 308 million people here. I took a look at the crime statistics broken down by race, murder, and I think murder gets reported pretty well, unlike a lot of other crimes. While African Americans make 13 percent of the population, they made 50, 51 percent of, of, of murder. Uh, arrests. We do. We, we what, so when when a when a when a black man walks by, isn't there? Can't a woman say, "Wait a second, compared to a white guy, there is a difference there." Uh, I mean, is she that could, she could I mean, she could think that, but the, but statistic, she can't her, she but can't. the statistics the statistics show would show that it's more likely that a white woman's going to be assaulted by a white man than a black man. And, and so, okay, but that's just numbers when, because there's so many more white men. But, but even on a per capita basis, I mean, it, it, it's still more likely that she's going to be attacked and assaulted by a white man. And so, why not clutch your purse when some young 23 year old who's super drunk coming out of the Lodo walks by you? Agreed. All right. Clutch your purse every time, lock your doors every time. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it is a fear and a stigma. and, and just as you can't relate to our experience as black men, we can't relate to a white woman and what she experiences when somebody's coming her way as well. To back it up to where this started, I, I think the president could have handled this much better from the beginning. How so? um, I, I, I think we looked at him as the healer, as the one who's going to come and really bring positive changes to race relations. He was going to heal the earth. Uh, I remember that. That's another discussion altogether. Uh, but our communities are in need of healing, and everybody knows that. Uh, Terrence said something that's very important, that every mother has had that conversation with their sons, and that's true. I've had it with my sons, and I'm a father. Uh, more fathers in our communities need to have that conversation with what their did you sons. Tell your kids? That's another. I'm curious. What do you, what do you tell your kids? My oldest son right now is 16. Just got his driver's license, and I gave him specific instructions what to do in the event he's ever pulled over. For instance, our windows are tinted to keep the sun out of our cars. Put down all the windows. Open the sunroof. Turn on all the lights inside of the car. I don't care what temperature is outside. Put both hands on the steering wheel. Yes, sir. No, sir. When you need to make a move, announce it. Sir, my driver's license is in my right pocket. I'm going to reach for it now. These sorts of things. Now, would you give that advice to a white 16-year-old, or, or is this something that, that you feel specific to being a, a black That's 16 probably a better question for you. I would advise it to any of my children. Um, to be honest, I would not think about that. To well, be honest, I would just say, do what, do what you're doing. And, we have. And, yeah. and, and for God's sake, hide the weed. That's what I've told all my kids. I tell my kids <laughs> to swallow it. Yeah, good idea. All right, you, you've had this conversation, or you, you've, you've, you've had that conversation from your mom? 
I've had that conversation from my mom, and, and also I've been involved as a mentor with mm -hmm. several young African-American men. I've had that conversation. I was a police officer for three years. I had that conversation with um, young African-American men when I was a police officer. You just had to have it. And even when I was a police officer, I was pulled over coming home from duty one night at four in the morning and asked what I was doing in a particular neighborhood. I'm like, I'm just coming home from work. And the officer said, what did you do? I said, here's my badge. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> He still said, get out of the car. Um, no, he apologized at that point. <laughs> so, so you, this, Zimmerman was not, was not a cop. He was stupid. Um, uh, he, overzealous. But, he was overzealous. I think he probably had a hero complex. Uh, but, I, but I look at this, and there seems to be a demand for justice. You know, the justice for uh, Trayvon um, hashtag, it's, it's big. There's, there's a call for it. There's a call to boycott Florida because of this. There's a call to, to bring up federal charges. Let, let's bring it over here. Federal charges, um, you know, we've got the DOJ looking into. The question that, that I, I come charge. down on all that stuff is, is that helping or making it worse? So why isn't Jay-Z and, and Stevie Wonder boycotting going into Chicago? Why are they saying we will never do another concert there? Uh, to me, that makes more sense, where you had 12 young black men shot to death July 4th weekend alone versus one Yehu who shot somebody in Florida. So I want to know where that focus is. If we're going to look at this case and say civil rights were violated, DOJ needs to get involved, United Nations needs to get involved and examine race relations, and all these things that different people are calling for, fine. But let's be universal about it. Uh, let's let's look at people who are getting shot in the street for no other reason than walking down the street and say that death, while tragic, is equally as important as Trayvon Martin's death. So strictly from an administration of law point of view, there is no difference. Strictly from a race relations point of view, of course there's a difference, but there's no white on black crime epidemic in this country. Th there just isn't. We, we don't have overzealous community watch knuckleheads shooting people every day. We do have blacks shooting people every day. So my whole thing is let's focus on how we improve our communities and not focus on what the media has turned into a circus because you've got a Hispanic white doughboy <laughs> when, when Terrence, uh, when Terrence who got, says, got prayed in front of cameras wearing you know, an orange jumpsuit. When Terrence says, hey, you know, I've had, I've been pulled over at four in the morning. By the way, uh, you know, I used to do late nights too. I got pulled over all the time. Um, I'd pull you over if yeah, I saw you see it. The yeah, but, um, <laughs> but I'd pull you are, over if are, I saw you walking. It, are, <laughs> you'd be right. <laughs> if are black, are black men pulled over more often? Is there a is there a sense that a black man driving down the street, walking down the street, we need to keep an eye on him? Is that, is that real from the black community, or do you think? That's real. I don't think there's any question that that's real. Now, of course, it depends upon setting. Uh, if you see a couple of black guys, 23-year-olds, wearing jeans and hoodies, walking down the neighborhood in, in Bel Air, Marina Del Rey, Hollywood Hills, they're going to get scrutinized. What are you doing here? What's the point? If you see a couple of black guys, 23 year olds, wearing hoodies walking down Colfax Avenue, probably not. Now, is that, institutional, is that institutionalized racism or is that just good police detective work? We can debate that all day. Uh, but of I course we that. get looked at more carefully. Is, is that needless to say. You got both sides of this. You're a, you were a cop. Is this good police work? If you have to rely on profiling alone, it's not. Uh, and, and for it's, any, not it's not profiling alone. Uh, if a couple it, black guys, 23-year-old, wearing right. hoodies, and, and they're walking around in Cherry Hills. Um, would you scrutinize that? Uh, I probably wouldn't unless there was some other thing that gave me cause to. Um, I, I just wouldn't. Um, it takes more than a hoodie. I was just in Cheyenne Frontier Days. They sell hoodies at Cheyenne Frontier Days. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, almost got, got, almost got, almost yeah, got but, a hoodie. But, but, it, but, it, they're, but they're hicks. <laughs> and I spend a lot of time with them because I own horses and I ride horses. You but what? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I know. But W.B. Du Bois says there's no one way to be black, and so yeah. I try to embrace <laughs> that. But I, like you, that. I would be more afraid of Justin Bieber walking around Bel Air <laughs> in a hoodie than I would with a group of um, four or five black men in hoodies in Bel Air because more than likely they're not trying to prove how down they are, whereas Justin Bieber, if you look at his career, he's constantly trying to prove 
that he's down. Well, you know, Terry, uh, you're you're right, this is a very, very, very powerful <laughs> point here uh, as it re relates to police work and profiling. So if I'm a cop, and I've never been, but if I'm a cop and there is a certain part of town in a predominantly black and brown neighborhood that is known for drug trafficking, uh, there's a park where needles are getting cleaned up by community volunteer groups and things like that on a regular basis, and it's 1 o'clock in the morning, and I see two or three young white guys driving in a car, circling that park, having conversations with guys standing by the stoplight, they're looking for drugs. I've pro successfully profiled them. There's, the reason they're down here is they're most likely looking for drugs. It, so it isn't necessarily strictly a one-way street. When we get into the area of police work and enforcement, profiling in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad thing. It keeps us all safe. If it's the only thing, then you start getting closer to the line where people start screaming, racism is real, and racism is real. And that's why law enforcement discretion is so important. And that's why it's so important that we get the right officers, they're trained well, um, they have con good continuing ongoing training, so you know where that line is. Uh, talk, talk to me about federal charges. The, there are a lot of people screaming for some sort of justice. You can't try this guy again for the same crime. The Department of Justice is looking at it as, as a civil rights violation. I don't think they're going to have anything to stand on there. But this call for justice, this call for justice, what, what does that look like? What is it, what is it that, that people want? What is it you want? And that's actually a good question, and I agree with you. There, uh, if anyone's holding their breath waiting for the Justice Department to charge George Zimmerman, just bury yourself now. I mean, it's just, it's just not, it's just not going to happen uh, because there's not enough there to prove as a civil rights violation, at least from what I've seen. Maybe there's some um, glove that actually does fit that <laughs> that's running around somewhere, <laughs> but I just haven't seen it. Uh, and when you talk, hear folks talking about justice for Trayvon, it's not really about Trayvon Martin as that particular individual, as that sure si seems to as, be. As a, it, 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 you have the feeling that it is, but it really isn't. On a, on a very um, visceral level, it's not about him as an individual. He's the focal point right now for all the perceived and actual wrongs that have been experienced by a group of people. And he provides an outlet to voice those concerns. That's, that's what Trayvon Martin is right now as a symbol. The demand for justice is this, is this greater demand for the ability for, the, for this country really to be what it's supposed to be, and what we all want it to be, and how we perceive it to be. I think Langston Hughes wrote a poem about it. It says, let America be America. Let it be the place it promised to be. And that's what the call really is for, yeah, where that, there truly wonderful. is equality I, of opportunity. I, I need some specifics here. So people are screaming justice for Trayvon. A lot of them took to the streets in New York and in Oakland. There's calls for boycotts. Here. You know what? What is, what is it they want? But I, I mean, what, I, what, I wish I could what would be satisfying enough? You know, do do we need to do we need to drag him on the streets? What do, what do we need to do? <laughs> in in for, immediate sense, it would probably be if you if you want to make it about Trayvon and George Zimmerman, it would be Zimmerman locked up in jail. I mean, that that would be the immediate thing. That's not going to happen. Uh, I, I, what you're starting to see, and and I've just started reading about it today, is an attempt to organize this frustration into something more. Um, concrete. Uh, um, and I know Roland Martin and some other folks were talking about you know, something along the lines that we saw after the Rodney King beating, where you had groups come together for self-improvement within the African American community. And I, and I think that's probably where it's going to head. I mean, there's some let good me, examples. Let me, let me throw out, let me throw out, we're getting tight on time. You talk about the American dream and the melting pot, and I, I hear people say, you know, this is, there's more racial tension than there's ever been in America, and I'm thinking, you know, we had a civil war. I, I, re I remember in the history books over <laughs> some time, but even in my lifetime, the statistic that I can count on, there's no, there's no bigotry index, you know, there's nobody, there's no survey that does it, but mixed marriages, interracial marriages, uh, children from uh, interracial couples, it keeps growing every year by leaps and bounds, more so all the time. Each one of you, I'm sure, could could list a dozen of your friends who have uh, kids from who have kids mm -hmm. from different mm -hmm. different races. You know, I don't see it going in a bad direction. I only see it going in a good direction with a few aberrations. Some of the, and I believe there are quote civil rights leaders, so called, who who benefit from constantly picking at the scab. Um, you, you're right. Uh, things are things getting better, things getting worse. That depends upon individual experience. But somewhere in the neighborhood of half of the white Americans in this country who vote, voted for a black man to be their president, not once but twice. 
So this, this, the notion that we're going to take this white Hispanic, let's call him white for the sake of conversation, a white guy who shot a black guy and make that the standard for race, race relations yeah. in our country. Yeah. This is how bad things are, <laughs> that this guy is shooting a black guy and we got him an all white jury yeah. and we just got him off. Well, to yeah, make that the standard is just not true. But what I see is, yeah, so people in Florida are going to their elected black representatives who are lobbying their black president in order to put pressure on the black uh, head of the Department of Justice to, to, to show that there's discrimination. I'm thinking, what's wrong with this picture here? I, maybe I'm missing it. I mean, it. It's the esoteric crisis I had when I was Speaker of the House. I would always talk about the man holding me down, then I became Speaker, and I wondered, how was I going to put my foot on my own neck? I mean, that, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the argument I always have with myself. I mean, I, I don't agree that race relations are worse than they've ever been in this country. You know, my mother lived through the 60s. Um, she lived through segregation in the Deep right. South. I mean, I, Unless someone has me on a plantation, I'm not going to say it's the worst. Would that's you, ever would been you in agree with me? It continues I, to improve. I, I, I look at our children and, and how they're being raised. I think things are improving. Um, that if we, nothing else, we're going to breed bigotry out because when kids are black, white, Chicano, uh, all in one, you know, which which part of me do you hate? All right, we got less than a, melt, right? got less than less than a minute. Put a, put a put a uh, uh, cherry on top of all this. What what does it all mean to you? Uh, what it all means to me is that we have got to get to the point where the standard in a black community that we hold ourselves to is higher than what people sitting at home watching the TV determine should be our standard. We need to be the ones that set the bar and be good parents and teach our children pro correctly and respect others' property. We need to do it for ourselves and not depend upon anybody else. What do we need to do? Be specific. Yeah, I, I would agree with all of that because I think personal responsibility is absolutely important. But I also think that there needs to be, in this country, an opportunity for folks to sit down like me and you. So questions could be asked, so statements could be made, real, direct, and honest conversation. Thank you. Well, can, can we all agree, though, we should never trust the Irish? I'm Irish, Terrence Carroll. <laughs> We'll see you next week, tell a friend. <laughs> this could be the least amount of hair you've ever had on this show, you know that? The least amount of what?